Okay, so this is laboratory number three. We're going to be doing maximum oxygen consumption, also a VO2 max. Uh, so before I get into any of those slides, I'll start right here on this graph. So you can see that we have VO2 versus work rate. As right, so we have the volume of oxygen consumed versus how much work or uh, how much power the subject is generating. All right, we see that there's a nice linear relationship between VO2 and work rate. And up until we hit a plateau, and that plateau is our VO2 max. That's exactly what we're going to be looking for in this lab. All right, so uh, the key is that when we get to a higher work rate, uh, in this example, when we get to 250, we'll see an increase in work rate, but we won't see any increase in VO2. And that means that we're maxing out our aerobic systems, right, and that any increase in work rate that we get will come down to uh, any energy that we get from our anaerobic systems. Right? We're maxing out our aerobic systems. We've hit our VO2 max. So any increase in work uh, will come from our anaerobic systems. All right, so to break this down, we'll look at VO2 as cardiac output, represented as Q, times AVDO2. Okay, so cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So really what we're looking at here is O2 delivery, and then we're looking at O2 uptake, right? We have to deliver the oxygen to our tissues, and then our tissues have to take it in and use it, right? So that comes down to uh, our cardiac output delivering, and then the AVGO2 as the uptake, okay? So now if we broke this down and we looked at a visual aspect, we can see this is a typical graph of cardiac output versus uh, your percent of your VO2 max, okay? So the y-axis is cardiac output in the liters per minute, uh, and then your x-axis is your percent of your VO2. So if you're at 25% of your VO2, you can see that your cardiac output is kind of low. Uh, and then it gradually increases up to 100% of your VO2 max. Okay. Uh, so you can see that there's a kind of a kink in the middle of that graph. And there's a reason for that. And we'll get into that right now. So again, cardiac output is equal to stroke volume times heart rate. All right. So if we look at the graph for stroke volume, we can see that there's a linear increase, uh, and then there's a plateau. And that plateau starts at about 40% of your VO2 max. All right, so if we're looking at stroke volume, which is uh, here it's milliliters per beat, right? So your stroke volume is uh, how much or the volume of blood that you can pump out in your heart per beat, right? So we can see here at 25% of our max VO2 that it's kind of low, and that there's a linear uh, increase up into about 40% of our VO2 max. Now, this increase in stroke volume comes from an increase in contractility of your heart, right? So when you're at rest, you're not really utilizing the full contraction capabilities uh, of your heart. But then as you start to exercise, your heart uh, actually expands a little bit, and it will contract stronger, and you'll get an increase in volume, and you'll get a strong contraction. So you'll get an increase in the, in the stroke volume. You'll get an increase in the volume that you can push out per beat, right? But this only goes up into about 40% of your VO2 max. Uh, the contractility of your heart will be maxed out at about 40% of VO2 max. So after 40%, uh, it can't expand any further. It can't contract any stronger, okay? So now it's maxed out, and it hits a plateau. Uh, however, our heart rate can increase all the way up into 100% of our VO2 max, right? There's a nice linear relationship between heart rate and our VO2 max, okay? So here we can imagine our heart rate. So we're at our maximum stroke volume, at the maximum contractility, but now we can increase how quickly our heart contracts, right? So now we get an uh, increase in our heart rate all the way up to 100% of our VO2 max, Right, and so now this is how we get an increase in cardiac output uh, throughout a VO2 max test. And if you imagine combining stroke volume and combining heart rate, you know, imagine combining those graphs and you kind of fuse them together, you can kind of see how you get the top graph of cardiac output. That's how you get the little kink at the top, right? So stroke volume, which is in milliliters per beat, heart rate, which is in beats per minute, uh, can combine to get you liters per minute, which is cardiac output. Right, if you look at those units, again, pay attention to the units. Uh, you have milliliters per beat, and then you have beats per minute. So if you did that in a mathematical equation, the beat terms would cancel out, and you would have milliliters over minutes. 
and that is uh, what you have for cardiac output, right? You have liters per minute. Uh, and then finally, we can look at the AVDO2. So that's just the difference in oxygen between the, the, the difference in oxygen in your arteries uh, between the oxygen in your veins, right? So you have rich, uh, oxygen-rich blood in your arteries, and it goes through your capillaries, uh, it gets dropped off into your tissues, and then the blood will come back to your heart, right? So there's going to be a difference in oxygen between your arteries, which has uh, a lot of oxygen, and then potentially a lot of the oxygen will be dropped off into the capillaries, so your veins won't have a lot of oxygen. So there's going to be a difference, right? We can see that, again, it's going to be kind of low at 25% of VO2 max. But you can imagine, uh, as you start to exercise, more and more oxygen is going to be dropped off into the tissue so you can use it. Okay, so our AVDO2 is going to go up. Right, more oxygen is being dropped off, there's going to be less and less in the veins. So there's going to be a bigger difference between our arteries and our veins. All right. Now, again, there's a little bit of a kink in this graph, and that's because when we get at higher VO2s, uh, the oxygen and the hemoglobin are going through the capillaries so quick that it's hard for the oxygen to be dropped off into the tissues. So sometimes it goes through the capillaries so fast, it doesn't get dropped off. So the uh, dropping off is less efficient, okay? So that's why we have a little bit of a, a kink in the graph. Now, the ABDO2, you'll notice, it still increases from 50 to 100, but that increase is just kind of reduced, so the slope goes down a little bit, right? So we're not as efficient at dropping off the oxygen, but it's still the, the difference is still increasing, right? And that's because the oxygen and the hemoglobin are going through your capillaries so quick that it's not efficient at dropping off the oxygen uh, into the tissues. Uh, so all these components combined, and uh, today we're going to be looking at this graph here mostly, which is VO2 versus work rate. And again, we expect a nice linear relationship up into uh, that VO2 max. All right, so now actually getting down to what we're going to be doing today. So we're measuring VO2 max, and there's a few ways we can do that. There's the prediction equation, there's a submax test, and then there's a maximum exercise test, okay? So the first one is just a simple prediction equation. Well, maybe it's not that simple. Uh, as you can see, that it's a little bit of a long equation, and you have to have some variables from the subject. But it's simple in that you don't actually have to get on a bike and do anything. You can just take certain values that you have from your subject and plug it in, and you can predict their VO2 max. Now, the advantage of an equation like this is if you're just trying to do maybe like a correlation study, you're trying to do it with a large population, it's going to be very cost effective and uh, time efficient to just take their values and predict their VO2 max. Okay? Uh, so there's going to be some things you have to know about your subject to do this prediction equation. You have to know their body weight, uh, height, age, gender, and then their physical activity score. Physical activity score is just a score that they give themselves from 0 to 7 and it's based on what they think their physical activity is. So zero would be a complete couch potato, uh, seven would be someone who's in great shape, maybe who trains for marathons or something like that. And of course, there's numbers uh, anywhere in between for the rest of us normal people. Uh, so you just plug in these numbers into the equation, uh, and you'll be able to get your predicted VO2 max. Now notice the components of this equation. You have age, uh, which can definitely play a factor into your predicted VO2 max, usually uh, people in the prime, maybe like yeah, college students or 20s, maybe 30s, will have a high VO2 max compared to older individuals, right? Uh, also, gender comes into play. Males tend to have higher VO2 max. Uh, and there's the physical activity score that I just talked about. There's height, right, because someone who is taller usually has a, a bigger thoracic cavity and they can hold more oxygen. And then uh, body weight is in there, but notice that we have to subtract body weight, right? And so body weight is actually a negative factor here. The more you weigh, the lower your predicted VO2 max is going to be. And if you look at the units, milliliters per kg per minute, that kind of makes sense. If you have to divide the liter of oxygen you can consume, you have to divide that by how much you weigh. The more you weigh, the lower your VO2 max is going to be. If you think about that in mathematical terms. The bigger your denominator, in this case the body weight, right, then the lower your VO2 max is going to be, the lower your predicted VO2 max is going to be. So that's why it's a, a negative factor in the equation. Uh, and last but not least, but look, uh, make sure you have the units correct before you plug numbers 
into this equation, right? The body weight needs to be in kilograms, your height needs to be in meters, right? So uh, make sure you have the right values and then plug this, uh, plug the values in for the prediction uh, equation uh, based on the subject's values. So another test that we could do is a submax exercise prediction test. So it's kind of combining exercise with uh, predicting the max VO2. Right, so basically, uh, you can see on the left part of your screen that we have four workloads. So you do a first workload, and then based on the subject's heart rate, you determine the next three workloads. Okay, so again, this is a good setup because we're looking at heart rate. Right? It doesn't involve measuring the VO2 directly, but you know that heart rate has a nice linear relationship to VO2. Right? That was one of the graphs that we showed before. And because there's a nice linear relationship, we can use the graph that's on the right and we can say, okay, their heart rate at the first workload was 100, and the heart rate at their second workload was 125. And then we can start making points on our graph. We can start to draw a nice, uh, nice linear line, and then based on their heart rate, uh, we can predict what their max VO2 is, right? Because we know that once we get at our max heart rate, we're going to be at our max VO2, uh, and so we can predict what our maximum VO2 is just based on a submax exercise test, right? So again, just comparing heart rate with VO2 because there's a nice linear relationship 